Hello everybody and welcome to another video from What Culture Wrestling and once again we are here to break down everything from the latest episode of Stone Cold Steve Austin's Broken Skull Sessions podcast and his guest this time is of course the legit boss Sasha Banks and not only do we get to hear from the legit boss but Stone Cold is so good he manages to break down the rough exterior of kayfabe Sasha and get to the heart of the matter where we also get to meet Mercedes Venado too which is a welcome sight indeed. Some brilliant stuff here. I can't recommend enough that you go and watch this. But in case you don't have the time, let me break it down for you. These are the 10 things we learned from Sasha Banks on Steve Austin's Broken School Sessions podcast. Number 10, she thought she'd be released in 2013. Now, back in 2013, Sasha Banks was worried about the fact she might be on the chopping block in WWE. She said she had a good feeling for these sorts of things and she kind of got the gist that she was not in a very safe position, to say the least. She had all the wrestling ability in the ring, but she hadn't yet figured out the character. So she had to put in some time to try and come up with a few gimmicks, something that maybe would appeal to the WWE brass. Well, apparently with the help of Tyler Breeze and Xavier Woods, they came up with five ideas, five gimmicks, and five characters for her. And the very first one of those was the legit boss, which you'd think an absolute home run, surely, yes? Well, no, unfortunately, because WWE brass just weren't into it, apart from Dusty Rhodes. The Dream not only understood the gimmick, but he also loved it. The way that it drew from her relationship with Snoop Dogg, of course, a massive influence on this character and persona, and he decided to help her run with it. And once she had that, she had the base, to help her move forward. Number nine, she knew Charlotte Flair was her magic partner. Now during these podcasts, Stone Cold obviously tends to ask who performers like working with the most and who they feel like they have the best chemistry with. And in this case, Sasha said the first person she really locked up with and realized was going to be her magic partner in WWE was one Charlotte Flair. She said from the moment they first locked up during training drills in FCW, the magic was there. Not only did she notice it, not only did Charlotte notice it, but so did the trainers too, because the lockup was so intense, it was just so something about it. Now obviously she would be proved right as the two would have huge matches on the main roster as well as sharing a number of firsts in WWE but apparently Sasha also felt like this was kind of fate and destiny because they had both been at WrestleMania 24 long long ago not as wrestlers but as guests of respective men in the company. Shock horror. Ric Flair of course was having his retirement match that year, Charlotte was there in attendance and Snoop Dogg was of course the master of the ceremonies for the Playboy Bunny Mania Lumber Jill match or whatever it was and Sasha had begged him to go with him and he took us. So not only did they eventually find their way against each other in WWE as wrestlers, but also they shared a moment there too. Number eight, she hated the Butterfly Divas title. For anyone with half a brain, this probably doesn't come as much of a surprise, considering a wrestler like Sasha, who was pushed so fervently for equality in the world of wrestling between men and women, having a Butterfly title was never gonna be something she was gonna be happy with. Now, as she states to Austin, this wasn't a jibe at how she didn't like the position that that belt meant she would be in on a card, that wasn't it. It was more about the fact that the women were working so hard to get themselves noticed, to get themselves equal to the men in the company, that this just felt like some sort of like sexy diva thing that didn't really do them justice. And obviously she was absolutely right. And to illustrate her point even better, she flat out asked Stone Cold, would you wear that belt? Would Roman Reigns, would John Cena wear that belt? Of course they wouldn't wear that belt. So why should the women? All very valid points and all summarized perfectly when she said how happy she was that the women's belt finally was made to look like the men's. Treat them the same, it's really not that difficult. Number seven, what she told herself before debuting on Monday Night Raw. Now, obviously, every wrestler's journey, you probably think they want to make it to the main roster in WWE. That does make sense. That should be the promised land. That should be the end goal. But as we've seen throughout the years, NXT stars going up to the main roster doesn't always spell good news. In fact, it very rarely does. But that is a truth that Sasha Banks was not naive to, nor was she blind to it. She said she expected it was going to be difficult moving on to the main roster in 2015. In fact, she even said she prepared herself mentally to understand that this wasn't NXT anymore and the matches that she had, she might just have to settle with one, not wrestling the way she wanted to, and two, not getting the kind of match time she wanted if she was going to start somewhere. Could be two minute matches, could be three minute matches, but she said either way, whatever she got, she was going to make it work. She says she knew this wasn't going to be an overnight thing. Of course it wasn't going to be. She was going to have to work hard if she was going to get the wrestling from NXT to be the kind of wrestling they were doing on the main roster. And let's not forget, she was already pushing against resistance from people backstage on top of things like during the holiday episodes of Monday Night Raw and the house shows that they were doing, the women were being offered to wear, or sometimes forced to wear, skimpy little Santa's helper outfits instead of their actual wrestling gear. So she had a long way to go, I think we can all agree. And it seems like that wasn't the only pushback she was getting. 
when she first joined the main roster either. Number six, WWE's women put her bags in the shower. Now this one legitimately blew Stone Cold's mind because he couldn't believe that the locker room was still like that in 2014, 2015. But Sasha said that's exactly how it was. And this whole thing of her moving up to the main roster a little bit earlier to do some house shows and stuff was to kind of test the water, see how the locker room would react, see how people work with that in the ring. And it seems like that just was not a smooth process at all. She said that there were quite a few of the women were not kind of welcoming to say the least. It was still a bit like a shark tank in her words, to the point where the women were actually putting her bags in the showers or in the toilets or wherever and just not allowing her a space in the locker room. Now, obviously, when it comes to all the juicy goss that I'm sure you're after, Sasha didn't mention any names about women who bullied her, but the names that she did mention were those who helped her during that time. And those were, of course, Naomi and Tamina, who would become her team bad teammates. Apparently, they were the ones who looked out for her backstage made sure she got a place in the locker room to get changed and stuff and also looked out for her in the ring to make sure nobody was pulling any rubbish with her during matches. It seems like the bond they had wasn't just as part of Team Bad but extended to real life too. Number five, being a heel isn't natural. If you've ever watched a single interview with Sasha Banks where she's being genuine, not necessarily one most in character but when she's just being Sasha Banks or Mercedes Venado if you will, you'll know that despite all the excellent, excellent work she does as a heel, deep down, that woman is clearly a good egg. I mean, this is someone who gets so emotional whenever she talks about her friends, whenever she talks about her work, her passion for this business. She is constantly in a state of almost tears because she just loves it so much. That joy, the positive energy that comes from her as a character, as a person, it it's hard to ignore. But when it comes to characters, I think most people would agree Sasha's work as a heel is where she excels the most. Stone Cold certainly does, and she kind of believes it too. But she says before WWE, when she was working on the indies, she actually preferred to work as a babyface. That is until, of course, all of the stuff she mentioned prior about like the locker room being dodgy and all the Shark Tank stuff, at which point she says this business, WWE, gave her a chip on her shoulder, and suddenly being a heel was a really great vehicle for expressing all that. Number four, what Austin told her after wrestling WrestleMania 32. Now, while WrestleMania 32 probably will not go down in history as one of the great WrestleManias of all time, ironically, my first ever live experience at a WrestleMania, of course it was, but on that card, there was a brilliant triple threat match between Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte Flair. Not only that, but it was for the brand new Women's Championship. This was a crowning moment in WWE where finally all of the talk about equality was actually provided some physical action. Now, the match was fantastic. The exact thing that this triple threat needed to be for such an iconic moment, but Sasha at the time really wasn't into her own performance, despite the fact that both her, Charlotte, and Becky all put in stellar performances in the triple threat. And after Stone Cold had brought it up, Sasha mentions this before he flips the script, and of course he does, because he's a great guy and has all of the footage you'd ever expect to show us some unseen footage of him talking to Sasha after their match, where she's basically saying how much she hated it, she thought she sucked, and Stone Cold tells her, like, no, you didn't, man. This was amazing. You'll love it when you go back and watch it. And sure enough, she says when she did watch it back with Renee Young for one of WWE's watch-alongs or whatever it was, she says she absolutely loved it and thought, actually, maybe I'm not as bad as I think I am. Number three, WWE didn't tell her about Hell in a Cell 2016. Now, to this point in 2016, there had never been a women's Hell in a Cell match. So you'd imagine that in the build-up to said match, they'd probably let the two women who were going to be in it know just what was going on, know the fact that they were going to be in the cell and give them any time at all to genuinely think about how they were going to work that match, you know, given that it's a huge moment in history and all that. But of course, this is WWE. They didn't do that at all and they left it till last minute until eventually Charlotte Flair found out about it, who then told Sasha and the two of them continued to freak the hell out, as you can imagine you would. She wasn't sure if she had the size or stature to pull off a match in the Hell in a Cell or how to even go about it. Sasha said from the moment she found out about the match all the way up until it, she was fretting like crazy. But on top of that, she didn't even realize she was gonna get to have such a moment with Mick Foley, of course, an icon of Hell in a Cell and cage matches, when he turned up to help them do the contract signing before the Hell in a Cell show. She said she was going crazy because at this point, this is like dream stuff for her. Number two, some choice words regarding Ronda Rousey. Now there's a point in the interview when Austin gets onto the topic of Ronda Rousey and he kind of wants to know what Sasha thinks regarding Ronda's impact on women's wrestling in general in WWE. Now Sasha doesn't kick off about this, but she does have a point of contention. It's one that I don't think is unreasonable. She does kind of screw up her face at the suggestion that Ronda had a huge impact and she says, 
WWE have performers here. They should have been paying her or others to do the role that Ronda was doing. They didn't necessarily need her to do that. Now, it should be said, she does completely acknowledge that Ronda brings eyes that wouldn't have necessarily been on the product. She doesn't, she's not like naive to that at all. Sasha did acknowledge though that Ronda was always cool when they worked together and she said she loved the match they did at the Royal Rumble in 2019. She was really proud of it, the match they managed to put on. And on top of that, she said she kind of changed the whole thing to help it sort of benefit Ronda a lot more in that match. And even the fact that she separated her shoulder didn't dampen the fact that between the two of them, she felt like they put on a good bout. And number one with a bullet, what really happened in 2019. There's been a lot said and written about Sasha's four to five month sabbatical from WWE back in 2019. During this time, she suffered through a deep depression and kind of puts it down to the fact that she didn't really feel like she knew who she was anymore. I mean, hearing a performer talk about the fact that they haven't seen their own hair or heard their own name in so many years must be so like mentally tasking, man. Like you have an identity, but the company have branded you as something else and it really affected her badly. She talks about how when she initially went to visit Vince McMahon, she said she just wanted to leave WWE forever because she felt like that was maybe the answer. She just didn't know anymore. Vince kind of flat out rejected it. So instead of that, she obviously took the time away to go and reflect on herself and go and find herself. And after going to some really helpful therapy sessions where she basically learned to manage her distress and understanding of the situation and how to just reconnect with herself as a person rather than as Sasha Banks, the performer, she says she felt fit and she felt ready to go mentally and physically physically, she was back to where she wanted to be. As you can imagine, this is probably one of the most personal points in the whole interview. It's something, an honesty and an openness that Austin himself appreciates and tries to relate to in the fact that he, of course, understood the similar pressures of trying to find the difference between the gimmick and the person and imagine how much those lines can get blurred when you're a professional wrestler. Either way, it looks like the time away has done Sasha the world of good. She's back at the top of her game, back on top of the business, and fingers crossed, it continues that way.